I say I am live and I'm thankful again to anybody who's been watching and I just uh, have like really awesome expectations for of what this is going to turn into. Um, I'm still learning how to, you know, mess around with, with the layouts here and um, I decided to use my laptop today. So uh, because the, the desktop is the fans are like running real high it's an older desktop uh, a mac um and so it bothers me that how that works uh oh well, whatever i'm gonna obsess about it um yeah i don't like how it's like not even like the top graphic is lower and i have to work on it uh but anyway uh again Appreciate anybody who's watching. Appreciate the the attention that you're giving the product, even if it's uh, not the best uh, production. Uh, but I I'm working on it, and I uh, appreciate your patience. Now, uh, what I want to do today is what I talked about yesterday, and that's uh, uh, just finish up the book, uh, "Emotionally Healthy Spirituality," which you see there over my shoulder, uh, the cover written by Peter Skazer. And by no means was this an in-depth look and book study. Uh, but, um, you know, my goal was just to kind of cover main concepts in each chapter, uh, and then just reflect on thoughts that I had about the content, uh, with my experience and, uh, my background as a professor, uh, at Trinity International University, uh, where I've been teaching for the last, uh, 11 years now, 11 years is going to be in, in July. And I've been teaching undergraduate psychology and counseling, uh, with a Christian perspective. And so that's, that's my my background, my, my qualification, uh, I have my master's degree in counseling psychology, continuing education credits the last 11 years. So I've grown in that. I haven't earned my PhD, uh, with the birth of our daughter, I kind of put that aside. Um, actually with marriage, I put it aside and my professor warned me, if you don't do this now, you're probably not going to do it. And I was, but I was just burned out from school at that point. So I didn't want to do it. And yeah, she was right. So uh, I don't know if I'll ever get to do it. I don't know if I'm I'm meant to, but uh, maybe my daughter will achieve that if that's something she wants. I'm not going to push her into it. So starting with uh, chapter seven, the title of it is Grow into an Emotionally Mature Adult. This is like the apex of this study. This is the point, right? We're getting to now the meat, the bones of what it looks like to be emotionally healthy. Uh, and I start with a quote from the beginning of the chapter. It says to this, a wise monk responds. He just he tells a lot of anecdotes and stories and stuff. So uh, I'm not going to read it all. But it, the, the response was love in practice is harsh and a dreadful thing compared to love in dreams. And it's a really wise thing. You know, when when one of the most the oddest thing I ever see and, and maybe this is just me and my wife, but one of the oddest things is, and we just saw this on a show we we're watching is a couple waking up and then, you know, being intimate with each other without first like brushing your teeth or and had to take a shower or something like cleaning up. Right. Uh, and I just don't know if the expectations are real on TV, right? Like I love my wife, but I'm not going to do that stuff without first um, cleaning up. Okay. Um, and I think that that's just like a silly example, but there's a lot of stuff about love on, on TVs and TV shows and movies that, um, that look, e make love look easy, right? Even, even when things mess up and, and sometimes you just hate watching movies like, like, uh, love actually, or ordinary people. Like these are movies where love is not going well and a relationship's not going well and love is difficult and that's the reality right love is not is not easy and that's what this monk is saying love in practice is harsh is a harsh and dreadful thing compared to love and dreams you know you might have to tell somebody hey your your breath stinks uh you go brush your teeth and that that happens in in honest loving relationships like you have to be close enough to be able to speak that way to each other and be honest with each other and to go through the messy parts of life. Love is not about a feeling, right? That's more about affection and, and all that kind of stuff. Love is about uh, a decision you make 
uh, dedication you make to a certain way of of life and that's a lot of um balanced selflessness right balanced selflessness knowing you know your limitations knowing where you are but also uh being willing to give up uh your own interest for the sake of someone else when there's good in that right uh, we talked about that a couple of sessions ago and how jesus modeled that for us now some of the questions uh that we ask about being emotionally mature are here uh, how can i be quick to hear and slow to speak right how can i be angry and not sin uh, how can i watch my heart above all else um, how can I speak the truth in love? How can I be a peacemaker? How can I mourn? We've talked about some of these things already. How can I not bear false witness against my neighbor? This is a concept that he talks about later in the chapter about reading minds about people. You know, he's like, you read, like you just assume and assume what people are thinking or what they're saying, or really assume what people are thinking and you put words in their mouth and how that leads to problems. And it's not, that's, it's a way, it's a form of lying. Uh, bearing false witness, and then getting rid of bitterness, rage, and envy. Uh, so the first thing he does, he, he he breaks down what it means to be an emotional infant, an emotional child, emotional adolescent, and an emotional adult. Okay, so an emotional infant, starting off with that, says someone who looks for others to take care of them, has great difficulty entering into the world of others, are driven by need for instant gratification, use others as objects to meet their needs. So if you literally think about a baby, now an infant is helpless also right like an infant needs people to take care of them if an infant is not being taken care of an infant is being neglected and, and an infant being neglected is against the law it's a crime uh and people are put away for that kind of thing and so you can't neglect an infant but what it does by doing everything for an infant which they need it can develop a sense of i need people to take care of me, otherwise I won't survive. And as a parent, you know, you have to raise your children out of that mindset. You have to raise them up out of the idea that uh, they they need constant care and gratification and help from others, right? Uh, even, even with uh, children, like we try to teach, with infants, we try to teach them, you know, appropriate sleeping habits right they they want to sleep all day they want to be awake at night we have to teach them no it's not about your gratification here uh it, and sometimes they want food and we look at their schedule like you shouldn't be hungry now um and you know it's it's hard they're feeding and everything else but sometimes children or infants can be uh a little needy in that sense and so as you get as they get older as a as a parent you start to put boundaries and limitations on what they can have what they can have and eventually they become children, right? And emotional children, just like real life children, are content and happy as long as they receive what they want, right? So if they, they, this is where like as an infant, the, the baby wants whatever to feed and so on and so forth. And if you don't put boundaries on that, then when they become older kids, they're going to just want whatever they want to make them to, to satisfy their needs, right? And so you start you start to have to put boundaries on that. And and emotionally, it's the same way. Um, as long as you receive the love that you want, as long as you receive the considerations that you need, uh, you're happy, right? As long as you receive the respect that you, you think you deserve. Uh, but as soon as stress hits, disappointment, uh, there's disagreements, everything starts to unravel, right? And that's just like a child, like a child can be used to a certain routine, and as a parent, you're like, you know what, this routine isn't helpful, isn't healthy. Uh, I got to put some boundaries on it and I got to get to grow you out of it. Then they can feel the stress of that and be like, oh my gosh, like things are changing in my life and I can't handle, I can't handle it. You know, like uh, for an example, this morning, uh, you know, some issues happen. And so it's like no screens before school, like you're going to do your schoolwork and then afterwards you can have the screens back. And there was like a breakdown of, of emotions, like, oh, you know, cause the routine has been changed and it was just, it's a consequence of own behavior. Right. And that's how it is for emotional children as well. Like if, if just that one um, time something goes wrong, uh, there's a devolution of, of personality, there's crying, there's, there's pain, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, and, and emotional children 
They will complain, withdraw, manipulate, take revenge, become sarcastic, have difficulty calming, uh, and calmly discussing their needs um, in a mature and loving way. It's more demands. Like, I need this. I need that. You should... You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. And that's very, that speaks to the, the nature of children in general. Then you have emotional adolescents, right? People who tend to be defensive. They're threatened by criticism. It was really funny because someone, uh, someone I know was talking about this newer, this younger generation and how hard it is for them to receive criticism. Uh, you know, like you can very calmly tell them, hey, you know, this, this work right here isn't at a high standard. The grammar is bad. The spelling's bad. Like you need to, you need to rework this and give it back to me. Uh, and you know, I do that regularly as a professor. Um, and I don't actually give them opportunity to give things back. I just give low grades. But I've noticed that the younger they are, uh, the the more difficulty they have taking that criticism. And when I first started teaching eleven years ago, majority of my students were older than me. They were, they were. I'm 40 now. They were in, they were adults already. Some of them were in their 50s, and they were just trying to get their degrees so they could get better work and so on and so forth. And man, they used to handle criticism so much. They just handled it differently. They were just like, you know what? Um, okay, I appreciate you helping me out with this. What else can I do to get better? And so we talk about it. And they took those skills that they learned the, from the criticisms, which is an honest assessment of what they're going through. And made made themselves better, and so I struggle now with younger students. Now, now my not only am I getting older, so my students are relatively getting younger, but in generally they are younger. They're closer to eighteen, nineteen. We we change our policy at a university where we start allowing eighteen year olds in because it's a very intense program. So we used to have like an age limit, an age minimum. It was like twenty three, uh, but now we start to let younger students in, and I'm noticing more of a difficulty in in accepting criticism. And so uh, an emotional adolescent works the same way. And they deal with conflict poorly. They're blaming, you know, go to a third party, pouting, uh, become preoccupied with themselves, difficulty listening to another person's critical and judgmental. Although I got to say that one thing about this younger generation is they're not as critical and judgmental as previous generations, at least in my experience. So they're, they're a little more accepting Okay, but you know when when they receive criticism and that may be tied into each other like when they receive criticism like why don't you just accept me like the way I accept others but you know sometimes criticism is meant to to sharpen each other right to make each other grow um kind of thing uh and then finally he has a list of what it looks like to be an emotional adult and this is where the the point the book is reaching to this point where it wants to help people become this right and the first thing is, Viva, ask for what you need, want, or prefer in a clear, direct, honest way. So not beating around the bush, not leaving hints everywhere. But, you know, if if you're a wife who's stressed and you need a break, you say it. Uh, if you're um, a husband who says, you know, I need, uh, I need time alone, you say it. Uh, my daughter, one of the things that she does is she goes to her room and she wants to be alone and she'll ask like can I have alone time uh sometimes it's not right away she'll just kind of ask when she goes to the room closes the door and we're like hey are you okay and they say yeah I need my alone time and so trying to teach her to be more mature about it and say hey I'm gonna have my alone time I'm gonna go in my room so announce what you want beforehand right um and communicate about that recognize manage and take responsibility for your own thoughts and feelings so sometimes you know, you, you get away from yourself and it's your thoughts and it's that, that and your feelings that are kind of making a situation heavier than it should be. And so you need to recognize that and step away from it and say, you know what, this is on me. This is not on other people. And that's a sign of an emotionally mature person, an adult. He put he makes it an adult. Uh, you know, he's, he's trying to say, like, this is the, the highest point of de our development and under stress. When under stress state, their own beliefs and values are becoming adversarial. So, okay, there's a lot of information coming. People are attacking or, or there's a debate going on. You can, you can calmly talk about stuff without uh, getting, getting um, in your own feelings about it, getting thrown mm -hmm. off. I respect others are having to change them, give people room to make mistakes and not be perfect. It's a really big one. I appreciate people for who they are, the good, bad, and ugly, not um, 
not for what they give back. That's a really hard one, right? And I was thinking about it as I was preparing and praying for this session. Session up on Friday nights, uh, I play soccer uh, with a group of friends. And there's been a particular person who, in the last couple of months, has been more, uh, more adversarial. You know, like arguing a lot, and and it was never like that before. And I was thinking about it. I was like, you know, they, you know, I appreciate the guy. The person is a nice, nice enough guy. Um, not perfect. And if I can think about more about where he's coming from, and realize, like, you know what, I think. When I get, I know when I get anxious or there's more anxiety, it tends to look like anger more. Like I get, I feel like I'm getting angry, like I have short, shorter temper, basically. It made me wonder, like maybe that's what's going on here. Um, and so I definitely have room to grow myself. Like I'm not an emotional adult always. Sometimes I revert to emotional adolescent, you know, and I get defensive. And so you said something to me, I feel to say something back. And, and, you know, ultimately that's not, that's not helpful. Uh, an emotional adult can ex assess their own limits, strengths, weaknesses, able to freely discuss them. I guess I kind of just did that. So I feel like in between, you know, just going back and forth, and that's part of growing maturity, right? Sometimes you're 40 years old and you, uh, you're an adult by numbers, but then you just go out and do something not very smart. And you're like, oh, why did I do that? I can't give an example right now. Like it's been a while since I've done something. Oh, um, I was I was installing some shelving for here for this room and uh, a screw got stuck in in the wall anchor and the wall anchor was one of these hard plastic ones that screw into the wall so when I was trying to screw it in then it got stuck in the screw and so I had to pull everything out and I just went ahead and grabbed it put my drill in there to unscrew it because like oh, I need to unscrew the screw and get it out of here I just went ahead and grabbed it with my hand and just tried to do it and I was like and it just tore up my hand. I had such bad cuts on my fingers from doing that. And I was like, why didn't I take the time to go get a pair of pliers? And I knew I needed pliers. I was like, oh, I can just do it by, by my hands. And so, yeah, that was a, a, a mistake that I made where I went from a 40-year-old adult to like a 16-year-old kid in a flash. And that happens emotionally as well. And an emotional adult uh, has the capacity to resolve conflict maturely and negotiate solutions and consider the perspective of others. Um, and with that, uh, he, uh, Skazero goes into this idea that I really like, uh, the idea of practicing the presence of people in accordance to, in, in along with practicing the presence of God. So there's this idea created by, or, you know, it's given credit, a brother Lawrence is a monk, wrote a book, it was called Practicing the Presence of God. As a monks, they live out on their own, you know, they're in their little monasteries, they have their own silent lifestyles. And he talked about, you know, when he would be washing the dishes and it's for the monastery, he's there alone doing the dishes it's the kind of thing they do. It's like, you're going to do this by yourself. He said he would practice the presence of God while washing dishes. He would practice the presence of God while, you know, sweeping or mopping, basically in the mundane things of life, you take the time out to recognize that God is there. Right? And Skyzor takes that idea. I don't know if it's original or not. He has he did, oh no, he has a reference there, so it's not original, but it's he takes that idea and he applies it to people. And the idea that we practice the presence of people means to be aware of people as they are around you. Right? So you're practicing the presence of God, awareness that God is there. And he's there with you. He may have something to say. He may have something he wants to uh he wants to share with you. Um and the same thing goes with people, recognizing that people are there uh, with you at any given moment and practicing uh, the idea that they have thoughts, they have ideas, they have needs. And so he, he also states this, that uh, while Jesus had a contemplative prayer life, something we discussed yesterday, uh, it also meant having a contemplative presence with people. And he talked about, um, as I scroll through here, he talks about uh, the times when he was attacked for spending time with people that the that others didn't didn't um, think he should be spending time with, but it was a reflection of the idea that he 
recognize the presence of these people, prostitutes and tax collectors and the poor, the downtrodden, the people that the, that the other rabbis and other higher ups are associated with rabbis uh, would ignore because for them, these people represented uh, the lowest of low and they weren't people that were worth our time. And that's the point here, right? Is like recognizing the value of people in your life, no matter who they are. That's why, and what they're going through. And that's why like this New York case, everybody's arguing about whether or not it was right or wrong for the individual who put him in a chokehold. If you're not familiar, there was a man who uh, was um, acting erratically, was harassing people, apparently, allegedly on, on a subway in New York. And so the response was, by one man to put him in a chokehold. Now I, I watched a video. There's a couple other people who were there, just kind of like I don't know what they were doing. Like they were checking to see, but then they were also kind of they weren't like trying to pull him off. Um, and one thing that you know with George Floyd, like you have to realize is that someone can die very slowly from deprivation of oxygen. It doesn't happen fast, right? Just like human facts, like someone can die very slowly. Like as oxygen levels start to slowly drop, you're starting to gasp, you're getting little bits of air, just enough for your blood to flow and, and continue to feed your body. But eventually the oxygen you had stored and whatever you're getting is just at such a low point that you you pass out. And and if, if the chokehold isn't particularly strong, it can take a long time. Um, while everyone's arguing about, you know, this is the right thing to do, is self-defense or whatever, he was harassing people. Uh, because of my own training and concepts like this, where we're trying to be emotionally healthy people, the idea that that you see any human being as less than a human being is difficult for me to accept. And I look at that situation and I'm just, I'm sad that someone was in such bad shape that they were doing what he was doing, what he was doing on a subway that our, you know, that our society doesn't have a way to take care of people like this ever since de deinstitutionalization in the fifties. That was when, when it came to mental health, uh, you know, there used to be these asylums, which weren't great either. They used to do these experiments on people and you can see Shutter Island, get an idea of what that looked like house on haunted Hill, like all these horror movies, because it's, it was terrible, right? What was being done back then. Uh, but the, it, it was decentralized. It wasn't the government or states taking care of these people. It became private, privatized. And so, you know, someone could have a, a, a home to take care of schizophrenics in, in your neighborhood. They could do that and, and get money from the government. And they have like little, very, very little training. And so their, their clients go in and out of their homes and they, and, and, and it's just, it's just a mess. It's a, the whole system's a mess. If you really look into it, if you have any experience with it. And uh, and so we don't take care of each other well. And so it makes me sad that this guy is a product of that lack of care for people who have mental health issues, substance abuse issues. Um, and he died that way. Right. And uh, Skazro talks about how M. Scott Peck wrote that we're all born narcissists and learning to grow out of that narcissism is a heart of spiritual journey. And it's just um, this idea that it's very difficult to do that, to not think like, well, if I was in that situation or protect myself, I got to protect myself and, and, and do what it takes to protect me. And I know that's hard. I have a family. It's not an easy thing to, to just think like I'm going to let someone be dangerous around me without dealing with it. Um, but that's why there's crisis training and that's why there's crisis counseling. And that's why we should have more access to that kind of thing so that if something like that does happen, it can be properly handled. Um, but that's not what's going on. And so now we kind of have to train each other how to do that. Um, that's way beyond the scope of today's lesson, but there is a way uh, to handle that situation without choking someone. There, There is. Um, and it doesn't involve, you know, violence. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to move on from that, but this is where um, Skazero talks about the importance of how we see people, right? And we can have I-it relationships or I-thou relationships. And this idea comes from a Jewish theologian, Martin Buber, who wrote about 
um, this concept. There was a book called I and Thou. It's a very well known thing now. He was a Jewish theologian, but it was it's become really well known in counseling circles uh, because of this deep idea that when we look at someone and we see them as human beings with a divine nature. You know, and whether you believe in, in the God of the Bible or whatever, the idea is that, that human beings have a divine nature, something that's beyond uh, this world. It's something that comes from a divine space. As Christians believe it comes from the God who, and Jewish people, obviously this comes from the Jewish background. This comes from the God who created the world and created human beings. And the idea is that we respect and have this healthy, mature perspective of those of others. And so we use the word thou, this fancy old English word that if you have like a King James Bible uh, would always speak about God and others like thou God are, you know, whatever that. But just like using the word thou instead of you and more modern translations will use you. But Buber was like, you know, I'm going to go and use that word thou to have to signify the importance of how I see other people, this divine nature and respect for them. Uh, and that's versus the, the um, um, I-it relationship. Okay, and the I-it relationship is where we see people as objects. And he, he uses these circles as illustration, uh, my world, your world. And when we have an I-it situation, we, we separate ourselves from people. It's like, that's you, this is me, and there's nothing to connect us. Right. Um, and in the I it relationship, he says here, it's it's I treat you as a means to end as you might use a toothbrush or a car. Right. Your relationship with people is like this relationship with my toothbrush. I use it in the morning. I use it in the evening. And when it gets old, I use it to clean like s small crevices that are dirty and hard to get clean. It's basically whatever you need that thing for. That's what you use it for. And that's how. Uh, um, the I it relationship works on with people. We just use them for what we need. And so he gave some examples of what that looks like. Walk into work and you just like kind of, you know, dump everything that's going on with you on other people and you don't even say hello. And you, I don't know, you, you may have been in the situation where you're like, you're sitting there, someone comes in, it's like, oh, no, 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 and they talk about all the stuff and they leave. You're like, wow, they didn't even say hi to me. They just came in and like dumped on me. It's because they're they're seeing you as an object, as something to dump on right and if if you've done that to others well you know it's something you need to grow out of because uh people aren't supposed to be used as objects in that way you know you walk into a room you respect people you say hello right you say hi how are you uh i i admit that as an introvert i struggle with that uh definitely you know i go to my soccer games and i know people there's like the shyness that comes into me it's like oh you know just hey what's going on like i'm i'm here like i i have to make an effort to remember that people um are are special are unique and it they all deserve at least a hello hi you know like i know someone's name you say hi so and so and and it's hard as an introvert. It's, it's like I, I value people. It's just like I have to kind of break out of my my the constraints of my personality sometimes to do that. But that's important to communicate and practice the presence of people. Uh, he gave an example, a business example. I move people around an organizational chart. A staff meeting is if they're objects or subhuman. So it's like basically pe placing people in places that doesn't understand the dynamics of what's going on with them. Uh, and, and how they might react to certain situations. Uh, I treat, you know, I like this one, I treat Jerry or our children as if they're not in charge of their own freedom, dreams, or autonomy. I expect them to be the picture of them I have in my head. That's, you know, as a family, father, you know, you, you look at your family, like I want them to be this, and so they are that. Not realizing, hey, my kid might have her own dream, which I said earlier, like, I don't have my PhD. Maybe one day my daughter will, but I don't know. Maybe she goes into music. Maybe she goes into art. She loves to sing. Maybe she goes into gaming. She really likes it. Uh, and I don't know if they have a PhD in esports, you know. And and I have to be okay with that. Like that's that's her life. I, I know there are certain things I don't want her to be. I don't want her to be homeless. I don't want her to be uh, addicted to anything. I, I don't want her to have, uh, you know, those kinds of uh, like. I don't want her to get into a marriage where she's being abused or any kind of relationship where that's happening. So there's certain goals, you know, hopes I have ultimately 
she has agency, she's going to choose certain things and all I can do is be there to help and support when I need to. I can't control it. Um, and this is all about the I-thou relationship. And I like this, this point here. Uh, the second one, I listen to my neighbor's problems and help them with chores around their house, hoping they'll attend Christmas outreach or church. They don't, and I move on to someone else. That's when it's the I-it. It's like I will do something for someone as long as I can get something back. The I-thou says I'm going to do this for this person without expecting anything. Reminds me of like a couple months ago, my neighbors uh, wanted help with like trimming their bushes. And I was just like, oh, yeah, I'll help you. And I went and trimmed it and everything else. Then the neighbors asked, he's asking me like, okay, I have a $25 gift card to Starbucks and this one she wanted to give me. And I was just like, no, I, I, it was, I was like, no, I, this is no way I can't accept it. Like I did not, ex I honestly did not accept um, anything. And I could tell that if I didn't accept it, they would feel offended. Uh, you know, the older generation, whatever. So I went ahead and took one of the gift cards. I was like, thank you so much. You know, and then I just used it to buy my daughter stuff. But uh, that's part of the I thou, you know, recognizing like I it also can be I'm going to do this for you and you're going to accept that I do it for free. and You're just going to be OK with that. Uh, that's another thing uh, that's that's difficult uh, to let go. You know, it's kind of that's another kind of pride also. Like you may want to do something for someone, not accept anything. But if someone wants to return a favor, uh, that's up to them. You know, and, and you accept that that's part of their their uniqueness as a human being. And they sh they deserve to have that opportunity, right, to return a favor. That's that's a but, but we don't have the expectations of that. Uh, it's just very it's kind if someone does that on their own. Um, and so that's the difference between I too and I thou. Now, I thou what he adds and it's really small. I noticed that now, but it says my world, your world, just like the other one. But then there's a sacred space that we recognize that exists between each other, sacred space. And so this, uh, I highlighted this portion here. For this reason, when we love someone, as well as emotional adults, treating them as a thou, not an it, it is such a powerful experience. It really is. It's not, and not just for them, but for you too. You know, when you start to treat people with the kind of respect um, for them that, reflects the idea that you you understand how special they are as a human being as part of God's creation um, that has a divine nature, sinful or not, right? Each person is created in that image. Uh, it changes not only how you see the world, uh, but it also changes how you see yourself. Uh, one of the things I didn't like in in the next chapter was the idea in the previous chapter you mentioned it, this idea of repeating this Jesus prayer, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And I don't like the idea of walking around every day, reminding yourself, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. If God has decided to forgive you of your sins and he's decided to forget your sins and he's decided to see you as his son, to see your life hidden in Christ of uh, Colossians chapter three, then why would you why would you see yourself any um, in any other way? Why would you see yourself as someone who is just a sinner? You're not just a sinner. You are saved by God's grace. You are now in His Son, and you're kept there. You are His beloved. You are His one and only. Okay, and so it's very difficult. For me to walk around every day and just like I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. Not even God is looking at you and saying, oh, he's a sinner, he's a sinner, he's a sinner. He's forgiven you. He's redeemed you. He's renamed you. Uh, he's repurposed you. He's fashioned you into something else, something new, created for good in this world. And so you should see yourself as that and see others as that, as having even the potential of that, right? If they're they're believers, they are that as well. If they're unbelievers, they have the potential for that. It's just not our job to, to rule over them or to lord over them or to judge them or to keep them, you know, pinned in and boxed in into rules and laws that we create for ourselves, uh, that we create for them to stay into this image of what we expect them to be. No, we see them as the potential of someone that belongs to the Father. And so we treat them with this great love and respect um, with the hopes, but the love, and it's not easy and the sacrifice of that will draw them into a relationship with you and with God. 
because God is in you. And in that drawing in, they discover who God is. I mean, that's so important here. Um, he ends the chapter, this chapter seven, about conflict and conflict management. Uh, I would summarize it this way, that an emotionally healthy adult is not afraid of conflict. But an emotionally healthy adult realizes that conflict is an important aspect of living in life and we can't avoid it an unhealthy person tries their best to avoid it or dominate conflict right like i'm going to win conflict every time it, there's conflict i'm going to win or every time there's conflict i'm going to run away you know a, a healthy person emotionally healthy person sees conflict understands that it's coming and takes the time to work through it now i'm i'm, I'm going through a lot of the conflict material trying to get to the next uh the next chapter here I just want to say this, uh, when it comes to conflict, uh, and he mentions this in the book, like Jesus talks about being peacemakers. Being a peacemaker doesn't mean you avoid conflict. Right? Being a peacemaker means you address conflict, try to find a resolution in that conflict, uh, and then in finding resolution, you find peace. Uh, and there's probably like two functional ways to deal, probably there are only two functional ways to deal with conflict. There's compromise and there is a resolution okay and comp compromise is needed sometimes and compromise simply means that that people are going to uh on both sides of an argument give up a little something for the sake of of peace uh and and says conflict with resolution with conflict resolution what you're doing is you're trying to find a way for whatever the conflict was to never happen again. You're actually trying to resolve the issue, right? And in that, there may be some giving up, but in compromise, it's usually, you know, we'll live by these rules, but then like, ultimately the rules can be violated and the conflict can come up again. And so I'll give you an example. Uh, when we first got married, uh, you know, we had like an early conflict about simple thing like you know, doing dishes or whatever. And, and, Honestly, like, I don't mind washing dishes. I can put a laptop up on my coffee maker or whatever, and I can watch show, have something on, or listen to a podcast or something. So I like that. It's a kind of like a way to have some alone time, doing dishes and just be alone. Uh, but what I hated was putting the dishes away. And I remember my wife was annoyed, like, I that I wouldn't put the dishes away or whatever. Do the dishes, put the dishes away, like, both. And I was like, you know, um, I don't want this to – be an issue as we get older like can we just compromise here like i'll do the dishes no problem you put them away right compromise uh and that way you know we don't have to fight about this in the future uh and and so that was an example of a compromise and really hasn't been an issue sometimes and, and honestly like we've grown in such ways where i i put the dishes away now uh i just so like you know what if oh, oh i remember the argument was the, the the annoying she has about the way i was putting not as organized the stuff i'll just throw forks in there or whatever and sometimes the spoons with a fork goes or whatever so that was a compromise now you know so like yesterday uh dishwasher was full she was at work i needed to do more dishes we, we try our dishes in the dishwasher so i was just like okay let me just put these away like and that happens more often recently and i'm just like you know it's not a big deal i can do it and she'll do the dishes uh and put things away and we kind of don't we don't fight about that at all um, you know, who's doing dishes. We just kind of like, we just, now we're just kind of working together to get things done. And it started with a compromise and I'm glad it never led to like any kind of big fight or issue, right? Uh, another time where we actually had to do, have resolution, not compromise, was about how we were feeling and fighting. And I, I'm, because of the family of origin that I have, alcoholic dad and everything else, I was very used to, withdrawing like a conflict happens i pull back I, I go into my shell i hide i'm not going to deal with this let the other person feel like they win or whatever not share my feelings not good for me not good for a relationship to do that my wife she is wants to talk about it and she wants to fight and she wants to you know she wants to get all this stuff out uh and so like those two things don't mix like oil and water like they just you know people like that would just go 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 and the other person's like pull 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 and so we had to compromise, you know, like, okay, if you're feeling something, this is for me, if you're feeling something, 
please share it. You know, like don't withdraw, don't hold back. And, and, and it's really helpful to know I have that freedom. Like, Hey, you know, I, I want to just keep this to myself, but this is bothering me. Let them, let her know. Right. Uh, and the, the, in the resolution, we said, you know, whenever that happens, you're going to listen, right. You're going to listen to what I have to say. We're going to, you're going to respect what I have to say. And one of the, one of the hardest things to do as a human being, when someone else is sharing their pain is to avoid trying to make them feel like you understand or even avoid uh, trying to um, discount what they're saying and ignore it. Right? The strongest thing you can do, and, and don't say to someone like, I, you know, I, I, I understand, I understand. I've been in the, I've been there before, whatever. Like empathy doesn't really work like that, that way. Uh, empathy is, empathy is for you to understand how people are feeling. It's not necessarily for you to then uh, use that um, on somebody well in, in 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 what i'm saying is like you don't you don't take those feelings of empathy and try to explain how empathetic you are uh sometimes people just don't they don't care that they, they're glad that you're you're empathetic that you understand what they really want to know is do you believe them you know when someone's going through a difficult time you say oh yeah that's like when my dad did this you know i kind of grew up in the same way so yeah it's tough that's empathy and the person's like, oh, okay, so they've been through tough things too, but okay, cool. Like, I guess not alone, and that can be powerful, but ultimately what's what a person needs to hear, what they should hear is, uh, you know, it sounds like what you're going through is like really difficult and it's got you depressed and you're feeling some things that you don't want to feel. I just want to let you know that I, I, I believe that that's, that's happening. And um, I don't know what you need me to do, but. I'm willing to do it. And just the idea that someone finally believes somebody as they've been holding in all these emotions, they finally let it out is way more powerful than being able to relate to somebody uh, or be able to communicate that you relate. We need to relate, but being able to communicate that is different than just telling someone you believe in them. And so when, when I would share like, oh, this is what's going on for my wife to say, okay, I understand um and i believe you what what should we do what do we need to do to make this different and so we work on things and that's that's conflict resolution uh and then the last chapter here in the book is about developing a rule for life what he means is developing a plan a system a structure for your spiritual life right it's kind of like if you if you're working out and you're like, I, I want to, like, I, I actually need to start, like, I need to work on my my muscles and my arms, my shoulders, my chest, uh, my legs, my back, my core, everything, basically. I'm losing weight, cardio, but I need to I need to work on the body. It's good to come up with a plan, right? Like, how often are you going to exercise per week? What muscles are you going to target uh, each day? Is it leg day? Is it chest day? Are you more all-around person? Are you going to work out three times a week for an hour? or two hours or five days a week for one hour like what exactly is the plan right and we build up our physical and then what am i going to start eating different how am i going to eat differently so i can feed this program so i can build muscle the right way right and it it works that way for our spiritual life too we need to come up with a plan uh, on how we're going to develop our spiritual lives okay and it has to be intentional but he talks about here how most people don't they just do what works, you know, like uh, whatever fits in the schedule, like, oh, can we pray now? Okay, let's pray. And, and not a regular scheduling prayer, but it's like, it's 1030 at night, everyone's in bed, falling asleep. Oh, let's pray. Uh, it's really convenient for the schedule. And it's good. You pray, you pray, praying your family, whatever. But it's it's better if you have things structured and planned out, only because we as human beings do better when we live that way. In general, like when we create schedules for ourselves, and we're not we're not uh, slaves to it. You know, the schedule has has variability in it. It's like, oh, I missed my prayer time earlier. Let me go ahead and do that now. I want to make sure I don't neglect it. The point of the schedule, uh, and he gives the example of like having a trellis. You know, um, I grow these vines in my backyard. I don't have a trellis, but I have it on a fence. And it's going, it's growing everywhere. It's out of control. So I have to constantly go out there and pull. It's like growing out of the grass. I have to like pull it out. I have to cut it in places, get going over the little wall we share with the neighbors. I have to cut it there to make sure it doesn't go there. Um, and that's what it means having a rule of life is just like 
it's growing, but you need to direct the way it's growing. You need to have structure for that. And so I, you know, I put up, I have these lights, I have strings. I want it to grow in certain places, but I don't want it to grow in others. And it works the same way with our spiritual lives. Like we, we want it to grow, but we do need to have a rule for it, a, a support system, a, a direction for it so that it grows in a way that's healthy. And so uh, the beginning of that is he talks about the first section is prayer. So to, to read scripture, to have silence and solitude, the daily office we talked about yesterday and study. So um, if there can be some kind of regular schedule with these with this subject, it's great. The daily office thing talked about last week, three times a day. You know, there's a there's a wide window. It's sunset. I mean, sunrise. OK, yeah, we start with the Jewish order of a day. So sunrise. Now I'm speaking all over. So sunset to midnight would be the first window of prayer for a day, right? Because they go from, from sunrise to sunset as a day. That's the first window. That's a that's a wide out um, time period. That's like, you know, in Florida now, like sunset's like after 7.30. So I, I pretty much like from between 8.30 and midnight, find a time to sit down and pray. Uh, now that one's usually before bed, but try to find that time. Then uh, it's from sunrise. The next window is from sunrise to uh, noon. Right. So I always do that uh, before we have our session because I usually end around before noon. So I need to right around noon. So I need to do that. So I get that done before the session, um, sunrise to noon. And then there's the afternoon window. It's from like 1230, one o'clock until uh, the evening, you know, the sunset. So you have a little wider window there. That's the one that I keep neglecting. It gets so busy in the day before I know the sun is set and I'm getting that other window. Uh, but having a schedule like that helps uh, because you just intentionally, oh, you know what? And so what I need to do is I switch phones. I used to have my phone alarm at 3.30 every day. I need to just do that again because uh, it would remind me, oh, it's it's time to just go off and, and be alone and pray. So that's uh, that's that. Uh, then the rest um, aspect, um, and he talked about Sabbath. You know, we're gonna, Sabbath starts this evening. We're going to have a day of rest. Tomorrow, uh, uh, you know, starting this evening into tomorrow, we're just going to relax, um, try to cook dinner before sunset so we can just and get the dishes done, everything so that we can just really relax this evening, sleep well, have a good day tomorrow. Uh, maybe we'll eat out. You know, oh, yeah, we're going to an event in, somewhere. So we're just just, you know, family time together. Uh, simplicity, play, recreation, right, doing fun things. I usually play f soccer Friday nights in the evenings, but going to take tonight off because of an injury I need to recover from. Uh, then work activity. Uh, he he means in terms of like what we're doing as a rule of life, right? Like growing emotionally, spiritually. We should be serving. We should be doing something in that sense, like serving our community that's around us, right? And then also caring. He feels for the physical body, which is which is boring. Gary Thomas wrote a book about that called Every Body matters uh to just recognize the importance of physical health and then relationships emotional health family community and, and emotional health is reflective of what we just talked about in the last chapter being an emotional adult taking the time out to 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 be a grown-up when it comes to emotions to recognize that they're there to speak to someone about them so on and so forth uh, so that's kind of the uh, the main point of of the last chapter he just goes into like the specifics like oh, scripture and study and prayer and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to do that now because of the sake of time. Uh, but anyway, it was uh, it was fun for me to to read reread this book to look at some of the things that kind of it's been a while and to see like oh you know, I've actually implemented some of the stuff that I've read in here uh, whether you know, it was probably like subconsciously or consciously I don't quite know I just know like certain things are important and I'm glad that I studied this book. 12 years ago or 13 years ago and that I can apply some of the concepts today that I have been for the last, you know, 12, 13 years. And then there's other places where I, I need to grow uh, in, in maturity. And so it was good to review. Uh, and so um, I'm happy for that as well. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you again for watching. I'm going to, I'll go ahead and close with some prayer and then uh, um uh, end the stream. Thank you, Father, for this day. I thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy. I thank you for this time for anyone and everyone who's been watching. Pray, Lord God, that you continue to help us all grow into that measure of fullness 
for the measure of stature fullness that is in Jesus Christ, meaning we grow into emotionally mature and healthy and spiritual adults, um, and that the standard, we understand that the standard is not each other, but the standard is, is him. And I pray, Lord God, that you would enable us to do so and help us to find safe places, Father, to be uh, to be emotionally free and to grow up and help us to find communities where we can build those relationships with each other. Thank you, God, again, for your grace and your mercy. And I pray all this in Jesus' name.